Good morning, everyone. My name is Irene Di Padua, and I'm policy officer at Bioenergy Europe, and I will be your uh, moderator for today's event. So before uh, entering into the details of today's discussion, uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, you are all in uh, listening mode and uh, you, your, your microphone is turned off. Uh, you can use the Q&A uh, box to put your question. Uh, we will start with a couple of presentation and we will address the question afterwards, but throughout the event, feel free to type in your question and also exchange with the speakers through the Q&A uh, box. If you have any problem, you can also reach out to my colleague Francisco or to myself, and we will be happy to, to cope with that. So why are we here today? Um, first of all, um, oops, sorry, problem with the presentation. Why are we here today? To discuss a very important topic, which is indeed how technologies and how solutions such as bioenergy can help decarbonize the industry. And uh, if we look at uh, industrial processes and the industry today, uh, renewables are still a minority part of it. So we have some 14% of the total energy consumed in industry, which comes from renewables, and almost all of it comes from sustainable bioenergy. So today we'll have a different set of presentations. We will have some insight from the policy discussion, and we have a representative of the European Commission, the DG working on climate issues, uh, presenting us the revision of the UETS, the emission trading system. But we will also look at market development and innovation. And that's why we also have another speaker from IA Bioenergy that will give us an insight on how the bioenergy sector can contribute in this context. After these first two presentations, we will open the floor for a quick uh, Q&A. And then we will dig into our roundtable discussion where we have experts from the industry, from local entities, from a different set of experiences. So, um, be ready and uh, prepare your question. And uh, I would, without further ado, give the floor to um, Marina from uh, the European Commission. So Marina, you should be able to share your screen. Thank you, Irene. Um, I'll start, hopefully it works. <laughs> okay, let me know. Can you see the slides properly? Yes, we can. Please go ahead, Marina. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, so as Irene explained, uh, I work at DG Clima in the European Commission in the unit in charge of the revision of the UETS as one of the lawyers there. So what I will be explaining today um, in short 10 minutes, hopefully, will be what we have proposed as a commission in the review of the ETS of the proposal adopted in July of last year. And I will highlight those elements of the proposal that are most important for bioenergy, so hopefully this gives a bit of a context uh, for the discussion as the EU ETS limits the emissions of, of industry in the EU. So I'll start by a context I would imagine most of you know, but still very relevant, I think, to, to understand what industry is going to be facing in the next years if the proposal is adopted as it, as it has been proposed. So starting with, with the very general context, this revision of the EU ETS is part of the Fit for 55 package, which was a package uh, adopted by the Commission in July of last year, and it aims to adjust the whole climate and energy framework of the EU to this new target that uh, the European Union has set in the climate law of achieving a minus 55% net greenhouse gas emission reduction compared to 1990 in 2030. This is an intermediate step, of course, to achieving uh, the headline target of net climate neutrality that uh, I guess everyone does, does know and has heard about. And this target of minus 55% is for the whole EU economy, and it then had to be translated to the different sectors. This is part of an impact assessment, if, if anyone is interested, of the climate target plan, and also of each of the impact assessments of the different policies. And it was translated in the ETS as a minus 61% target, which is relevant to understand because this is what industry will be subject to, together with the other sectors that you can see listed in the orange box to the left. Those are the sectors that are part of the Apologies. current ETS. Marina, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but I'm yes. afraid we have some problem with the presentation. So if you don't yeah. mind, I will share it on my end and sure. uh, because we cannot really see the, um, the full presentation. It's the same problem as before, I guess. Yes, exactly. Apologies for that. Okay, no problem. Let me know. I can I can still keep explaining while you share. Yes, I will. Uh... You prefer. Okay. Yes, yes. Please go ahead with the. Uh, okay. With... <laughs> 
Um, so just to recall that this target, the minus 61% covers those sectors that are currently within the ETS and also maritime that is proposed to be included within, within the new ETS. It does not cover, however, road and transport, road transport and buildings, because those are part of a new separate ETS that is proposed. And that is still part of the effort sharing sectors. So it has a different target. This means for industry that when competing to buy allowances, they will not be competing with road transport and buildings because it's subject to a separate ETS and, and possibly a different price. Um, are the slides fine now? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so, and thanks for changing it, Annie. So, of course, this target had to be translated then into the rules of the ETS. And, and the first change that needs to happen in the ETS is that the cap needs to be adjusted. The cap is the total number of allowances that are issued in the system. So it needs to be, it is basically the limit to how many emissions can take place in the EU and it had to be adjusted. There's details in the slide on, on how this is done, uh, but ultimately there's a one-off adjustment in the year of entry into force. And then there's a step-by-step -step reduction every year reaching 2020, uh, 2030. Irene, if you can change to the next, thanks. Um, there you can see, and this is, basically it's what's what is important here is to understand that there's there's a, a tighter system right now in the ETS if it is adopted as proposed um, which in any case be it this way or another we need to adjust the whole system of the ETS to align it with the new ambition so this definitely will be will be happening in some form and thank you Irene. and so this adjustment of the cap also means certain changes for the different elements of the, of the ETS and some of the allowances in the system are given for free to industry. In this context of a more stringent cap, there are less allowances to be, to be awarded. So what the revision does is that it also changes the rules so that the free allocation that is available is uh, given more targeted, so to the industry that really needs it. And I want to highlight three changes of the proposal in this sense. First is that to have a better targeted free allocation, the benchmark, which is the level to which uh, that determines how much free allocation is given to industry, is updated at a higher speed than currently. Then part of the free allocation is made conditional to implementing certain, certain energy efficiency measures. So if industry does not implement them, they will lose, um, they could lose 25% of the free allocation. And then the third point to adjust the free allocation is the phasing out for those sectors that are subject to the carbon border adjustment mechanism. As you probably know, free allocation is a way to protect industry so that it does not relocate outside the EU in case, uh, well, to move to other countries where there's not uh, a carbon price. And, car and the carbon border adjustment mechanism is an alternative to this. So whilst the carbon border adjustment mechanism is phased in, the free allocation would be phased out. This will take um, place during uh, actually quite so many years. So free allocation would only really reach zero in 2035. And this applies to those industrial sectors that are subject, of course, to CBAM. And uh, those you can see in the slides, it's iron and steel, cement, fertilizers, and aluminium. So these will also see a change in the free allocation. And uh, now I wanted to explain the four main changes that are relevant or more relevant to bioenergy of the proposed revision of the ETS. The first is um, those related to funding. Of course, as we have a tighter system, we need to accelerate investments in low carbon innovation. So for that, the proposal of the commission proposes to increase the innovation fund. It also proposes that those allowances are phased out from the phasing in of the CBAM are also moved to the innovation fund. So it will be much bigger. Um, and the scope of the Innovation Fund is also extended to carbon contracts for difference. This means that there will be more funding that could potentially also be relevant for bioenergy. Already the Innovation Fund can fund um, low carbon technologies and processes in industry, can also fund CCS and CCU, which can be relevant for bioenergy with CCS. And it can also fund products that substitute carbon intensive ones in industry. In addition, in the proposal, um, the Commission um, aims to give special attention to those projects in the, sub in the sector subject to CBAM and uh, to support low carbon technologies there, CCU, CCS, and also renewable energy. So hopefully that will be, that will be providing necessary funding and innovation. And the last point also on the funding available is that the Commission proposes that member states use 100% of their auction revenues for climate and energy purposes, 
currently it's only a soft obligation of using 50% of the revenues. And this is quite an amount. Between 2018 and 2020, the amount of the auction revenues was between 14 and 16 billion annually. And this can be used to, it's quite a broad list of, of areas in which the member states can spend it. And they include low carbon, um, the low carbon economy in general, renewable energy technologies. So it's quite broad. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, the, second, the second amendment of, that is proposed in the review relates to the use of, of biomass in ETS installations. So currently, and I will get back to it, the use of biomass in the ETS is zero rated. It means when counting the emissions for which installations need to surrender allowances, emissions coming from biomass count as zero. So there's no need to surrender allowances. And in the ETS, we exclude from the scope those installations where the emissions come 100% from biomass. And we are proposing a change to lower this threshold to 95%. And this is because, as I said before, in a tighter system, there's free allocation to go around. So installations that use just a bit of biomass are in the ETS, and they do receive free allocation, but they actually do not really need it because most of their emissions are zero. So these are, that is why the threshold is being reduced. So installations that use 96%, 97%, 98%, they will also be excluded from the ETS. So they wouldn't be receiving the free allocation and it can arrive to those sectors of industry that they really need it. Uh, in the next uh, amendment that was proposed, thanks. Um, we, it relates to, to zero rating of emissions that I was uh, just explaining now. So this rule of zero rating emissions coming from biomass is already in the ETS directive. And there's um, a, second, a secondary level uh, act that actually requires that the biomass needs to be sustainable for it to be zero rated. The biomass needs to comply with the requirements of the renewable energy directive for the zero rating to apply. So this is already the case. What the directive is doing now is that it is proposing to clarify that the commission has uh, the proper empowerment to establish the concrete rules on how the red two requirements will be applied in the ETS for the biomass to be to be zero rated. So already in this context, installations in the ETS that use biomass they have a benefit because they save in allowances either because they already receive free allocation that they don't need to use because the emissions count as zero or they don't need to buy it. Uh, on the other hand, if the biomass is not sustainable, it is treated as a fossil fuel. So allowances need to be surrendered for it. And this is also what requires the additional change that is proposed in the last bullet that you can see in the slide. And this is an empowerment to the commission to specify how we're doing the accountant, the accounting in case CCS is used. And there's streams that are mixed of zero rated uh, emissions and non-zero rated. It's quite technical, but if currently CCS is used in an installation that uses sustainable biomass and fossil fuel and has also has fossil fuel emissions, if 100% of that uh, stream of emissions is stored, we don't really need accounting rules. There's no issue. There will be a calculation of what emissions have been um, emitted and that will be considered as zero because it's considered as stored. So zero emissions are accounted for what is stored. However, when there's a mixed stream and only a part is stored, we need to decide what is being considered stored first. For example, if we have a mix of 60% fossil fuel and a mix of 40% uh, with 40% sustainable biomass, and only 50% of that is stored, we need to decide which parts corresponds to what. So there's an empowerment given to the commission to establish these rules, which can be relevant to incentivizing um, more CCS use, more biomass use, or um, in different, in different um, proportions. So it's quite technical, but it will still be relevant for, for bioenergy. And then moving to the next, please sit in it. Thank you. Yeah, and that brings to, to the last point, which is negative emissions. As I was explaining, if CCS is used in the ETS, the emissions count as zero. But already when biomass is used in the ETS and it's sustainable, emissions also count as zero. So one could also consider that negative emissions um, have been produced when, when CCS is used with sustainable biomass. But the ETS does not recognize it at this stage. So actually, this is an explanation of an amendment that is not included. 
um, but the reason is that the focus of the ETS right now is to reduce the production of emissions. The focus is not that much negative emissions, which are definitely relevant, but will be more relevant towards 2040, 2050 in achieving our, our net uh, climate neutrality target. And also the other reason why this is not included right now, the recognition of negative emissions in the ETS, is that the commission is currently preparing a legal framework for carbon removals. In December of last year, uh, the commission presented a communication on sustainable carbon cycles that looked into carbon farming and industrial management of carbon through CCUS. And there is a regulatory framework upcoming by the end of this year. And this will be the one that will establish how these removals need to, need to take place so that they're considered authentic and they're verified and this all happens in a transparent manner. So it's awaiting this framework that uh, we have not considered negative emissions currently in the ETS. And after, in view of that framework, we'll consider how this could be taken into account in the ETS, if they should be. And, and I think that finishes the list of the most relevant changes for bioenergy. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Very interesting presentation and thanks indeed for giving us uh, some insight on which role bioenergy and biomass can play in the context of the UETS revision. Um, I think I, I see there is one question in the chat, but maybe what we can do is to move on to IEA Bioenergy's presentation and then get back to all the questions and answer them uh, together in the Q&A session. So, um, yep, I think the floor is yours. Uh, you should be able to share your screen with the, the PowerPoint. And again, uh, feel free to uh, type in your questions. We have a Q&A box specifically for there. Whereas the chat, uh, I think it will be a good uh, opportunity to maybe introduce yourself or discuss with the other participants. But if you have questions, please do go on the Q&A box. So it will be easier for us. OK, yes. yeah, you can see your slides. So please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Larry. Uh, and uh, thank you also for uh, providing this opportunity to share some of the results of this uh, study that we did within IA Bioenergy uh, about uh, the role of biomass and in industry. And uh, uh, just let me introduce bioenergy, uh, the IA Bioenergy Agreement first. This is a, a part of the uh, IA Bio uh, of the IA uh, uh, organization working on the under the auspices of the IA. We have. Uh, uh, within the agreement about 11 thematic working groups, uh, tasks we call them, and um, five of these tasks were involved in this particular project on uh, bioenergy for high temperature heat in industry. Uh, personally, I'm involved in uh, task 32, which is biomass combustion. Uh, other tasks uh, that were involved are classification, uh, thermal liquefaction, and also uh, we call it the MSW task, but um, uh, the, the role of uh, municipal solid waste in the circular economy. Um, there's also one other task involved that's more about deployment of bio-based value chains. So they, they are looking at market issues. Um, the IA has uh, been uh, drafting uh, scenarios uh, uh, also for the last uh, COP meeting. In Glasgow, and what we see here is uh, uh, the uh, 1.5 degree scenario, uh, the net zero emission scenario, uh, and where, uh, where we see also that bioenergy plays uh, an increasing role. We see uh, that uh, a more than doubling contribution of, uh, of bioenergy uh, to the energy mix in 2050. Um, if you look more closely at this role of, of bioenergy, we see that uh, industry, that's the light green part of the bars here is also more than doubling. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a key area where we, uh, we as, as IA think that uh, bi biomass can play a, a significant role. Uh, I think I uh, don't, don't need to say much about, uh, uh, about uh, ETS and CBAM anymore. And this was already covered by, uh, by the previous speaker. But at least uh, I need to, uh, to underline that uh, this is a, an important driver uh, for the use of biomass in industry. Of course, there are other options as well uh, to, to, to reduce CO2 emissions from fossil fuels here. That can be CCS, but uh, other options are also electrification or the use of hydrogen. And of course, um, you need to consider all of these options. Um, 
the various options are depending on the use of, uh, of the heat and industry. What we see, uh, if you look at the different sectors, uh, is that the, uh, the temperatures needed in the different processes may vary quite a lot, like in the steel and uh, uh, steel industries and uh, some chemical plants, uh, high temperature heat is needed, sometimes over 1500 degrees centigrade for baking processes, uh, cement, clinker. Um, and this uses a lot of, uh, of heat, of course. Uh, and there are already uh, many uh, projects ongoing to, to make uh, steel industries, for example, more, uh, more, su more sustainable and uh, achieve a lower carbon footprint. But uh, looking at all the other different sectors here on the left hand of the, uh, of the bar graph, we see also that there's a significant heat demand uh, in uh, various industries up to about uh, 500 degrees centigrade. And um, yeah, that can often be delivered by, uh, for example, process steam. And here is the sector where, uh, where biomass is usually also interesting. Uh, we see here the current use of biomass in industry. Um, and uh, uh, one of the other, one of the various fuels is biomass here, but there's also natural gas, coal or other, uh, fuels. And uh, we see here that biomass currently delivers heat mainly between 100 and 200 degrees. So this is a uh, process team. Uh, and here you see on the right hand side of the, of the slide that this is mainly an in industries where there are already wood residues available, wood, and wood product industries, and also pulp and paper industries, for example. Those are, uh, there it is already very common to use the residues. Um, nowadays, however, we see that there are uh, uh, also in other industries uh, uh, good examples coming up of the use of biomass that can be sourced locally. So why can this be interesting? It comes in many different types of uh, forms and uh, uh, both in terms of fuels and uh, technologies available. So it is quite compatible with, uh, with many fossil fuels. Um, another uh, advantage is, of course, that it, we can provide the energy on demand in contrast to solar or wind. And uh, retrofits can be relatively small. Uh, I will show an example of that, but uh, in some other cases, it can take a lot of space also. So this is an issue sometimes. Um, negative emissions uh, uh, are possible when we combine it with CCS, as the previous speaker mentioned. And, uh, this is uh, particularly for the future uh, uh, relevant, I think. Uh, it is, however, also needed to look at uh, the local conditions. Tailor-made solutions are needed. Uh, uh, so some technologies are more mature than others, and uh, uh, prices and, uh, uh, and availability of uh, fuels may uh, quite differ over, uh, uh, over the regions. Uh, Sometimes the, 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 the uh, supply of fuels may cause some logistical challenges, particularly for larger plants. And as I said, uh, uh, local, uh, locally available space may be limited in some cases. So these are five case studies uh, that I will just summarize very briefly in one slide each, uh, just to give you uh, uh, a glance of, uh, of what is possible. So the first one is a, uh, is a potato processing industry in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, it's a nine megawatt uh, steam boiler that is uh, used to, uh, to deliver processed steam to potato processing industry. Uh, and you, what you see here on the left-hand side is a very low grade type of biomass. So this is really uh, wood residues for, available from local uh, municipalities, uh, uh, which really doesn't have any other use than uh, than burning, um, and it has a very high ash content, and uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's not a very common type of wood chip, as we all know it. Uh, however, what's interesting is that uh, by using such a very locally available fuel, uh, it, it's, it's also possible to uh, obtain uh, long-term supply contracts and uh, uh, get this at an uh, affordable price. Um, of course, then the plant becomes more expensive by, because you need to, to take up, uh, appropriate technical measures, but uh, by using uh, it full load uh, 
all the time, 7,000 full out hours per year, it can still provide an attractive business case. And also environmentally, this it makes a lot of uh, sense, of course, to use very locally available fuel uh, and use that for a local heat demand. Second uh, study is about uh, gasification in a small cardboard uh, factory. And uh, uh, here we see that uh, paper rejects uh, are used as a fuel uh, and that uh, uh, saves on uh, uh, waste disposal because uh, previously this was being disposed of. Uh, it saves on the use of natural gas. Uh, it saves on primary energy, CO2, and also the processing cost uh, for the whole factory. So uh, basically this was just a market-driven uh, project uh, with an innovative uh, technology, uh, CFP specification. Uh, the third one is, a, is a slightly different. Uh, this is uh, an, an example uh, in a dairy factory where uh, fast pyrolysis bio oil was used. So this is a rather expensive fuel in contrast to the previous ones where um, uh, um, uh, sawdust is first being pyrolyzed to uh, to, a, to an oil, you see it here on the right hand side. Uh, this is an expensive oil, about uh, 18 euros per gigajoule. But um, uh, on the other hand, the investment in the plant is uh, really low. Uh, it, there was just an uh, additional burner installed in an existing boiler and some, uh, some flue gas treatment uh, was needed to comply with emission regulations. But uh, such a plant can then be used in, uh, in peak load. So for a small number of hours, you can uh, make, make, make uh, the heat uh, in a renewable manner, uh, with still low investment cost. Uh, however, the, uh, the OPEX is of course high, uh, but this is also the case for natural gas. So you can still have an attractive business case uh, with a plant like this and, uh, and then have uh, also very low space requirements only the uh, storage facility is needed for the for the oil on, on site and a burner the fourth case study is a waste to energy plant which was uh, installed in uh, sweden uh, near a paper mill what we see here is also that uh, uh, waste is being used uh, from uh, uh, western sweden and eastern norway to deliver um, uh, to this plant and uh, uh, here it was also a market driven approach uh, reducing CO2 emissions uh, also other emissions uh, from an, an, an old boiler which was now taken out of operation and reducing uh, landfill of waste the last case study is a uh, it's an innovative project i think it's from switzerland the largest bakery there uh, by the bakery of co-op some of you might know them. Um, and here, wood residues, together with the grain residues, are used as fuels to, uh, to produce thermal oil, which is then used to bake the bread in the, in the bakeries. So uh, it's a nice example as well. There's some takeaway messages from these uh, examples. Uh, there are several types of fuel and technology combinations commercially available, proven uh, in real life. Uh, really depending on the type of heat demand, uh, varying from uh, uh, low temperature steam uh, to uh, high temperature thermal oil. Uh, the potential is certainly not limited to the energy intensive industries, uh, also smaller pro process industries. Uh, they represent a large potential and uh, the amount of fuel needed to cover uh, such an industrial heat demand can often be sourced locally. This is a, a very interesting point, I think. Uh, if you are able to, uh, to safeguard long-term delivery at an affordable price, uh, this is not uh, always possible for fossil fuels, I would say. And finally, the optimal combination is very site-specific and you need to assess that carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yap. Very, very interesting presentation and very glad you stressed the fact that indeed there are different types of biomass, uh, different application based on the needs of the industry, but that overall the sector can indeed cover different temperature and range pressures and uh, use depending really on the local needs of the businesses. So 
Uh, this is really, really an interesting overview from my side. Uh, maybe a quick question before going back also to Marina, because I see that in the, in the Q&A box, we have uh, several <laughs> uh, questions already. Um, maybe, yep, uh, well, I think from your presentation, it's quite clear that bioenergy will play a role. Maybe can you tell us a bit more about maybe 2040 and 2050 and how industry also can, uh, can be a part of this transition? So what, uh, what this sector can bring into the decarbonization of industrial processes? I mean, you touched it upon already in the presentation, but I think it would be interesting if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on that. Yes. Uh, well, what we see in practice is that there's a trend uh, ongoing uh, from high quality uh, types of biomass to, uh, to lower quality types of biomass. And uh, uh, as, as far as we, uh, uh, we are concerned, we think that, uh, uh, that this trend will continue. There will always be uh, low, relatively low grade biomass types available in the bioeconomy. Uh, where, whereas uh, higher types of uh, quality, higher quality types of biomass will uh, will be used also for higher quality applications, and uh, uh, but this trend will continue. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we cannot uh, uh, drive the whole economy on biomass, mm -hmm. but we already see that uh, in some cases where, uh, in some countries where biomass is. Uh, uh, available in abundance, like in uh, Sweden, uh, we see that, uh, that it can provide uh, a significant part of the uh, energy mix. And this will Absolutely. continue. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I think we all, all agree on this. I also see there is another question. Uh, first of all, a, a thanks for the interesting cases you presented. But also, what do you think are the incentives to get rid of fossil fuel in industry? And which are the most promising ones in this context? Yes, I, I think I can only uh, agree uh, to my previous speaker, uh, Marina, about the uh, uh, about the ETS system. Uh, that this this can really be uh, a very significant uh, 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 drive for industries to uh, uh, to become uh, more renewable. Uh, so I think that is the main uh, mechanism uh, on the longer term. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. So Marina, maybe you want to get back to a couple of the questions that uh, I think your presentation on UETS really heated up a little bit the debate in the in the chat box in the Q&A box. So um, maybe well, one question is about uh, uh, which is the, the rationale behind the idea of lowering the, the threshold for biomass from 100 to 95 percent. And what do you think will be the impact of this proposal? So do you think this risk to dis disincentivize companies to get to bioenergy because then they will get free allowances with other solutions? Or can you maybe elaborate on this a little bit more? Yes, indeed. Uh, maybe it was not uh, too clear. And I think there were more questions related to, to that. Um, so as I was explaining in the presentation, because we now have a more stringent ETS with less allowances to be given away, we need to make sure that it is given in a more targeted manner to industry, and that is because that is the aim of free allocation, is to prevent carbon leakage. So the idea is that the free allocation is given to those sectors that need it most. And those installations that use nearly 100% biomass, they don't really need to surrender allowances in the ETS because the emissions will nearly be zero. And that is why, if excluded from the ETS, they do not uh, lose in terms of what they have to surrender, but there's more allowances left in the system for for free allocation for the industry that needs it. It's true that those installations that are currently in the system will be receiving and, and to use nearly 100% biomass will be receiving free allocation. So there is in a way a benefit that is lost from, from being out of the system, but the system uh, is there to, to trigger the emissions and the, they, they are not considered emissions. So that is why, and we calculate around 300 installations could then be uh, excluded from the ETS because of this rule. So it's a bit of a trade-off, but uh, we need to make sure that the system also works for, for industry because that is what is designed for the free allocation. That would be the, um, the rationale for that. Oh, um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the clarification, Marina. Maybe can we connect also to another question, which is always on the revision and touches upon the BEX, so the negative uh, emissions, since you also kind of mentioned it uh, before. Um, there is a question which is addressing directly the report from the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Lise, and uh, 
it basically is asking which are your thoughts about uh, the possibility of including BEX and uh, also providing that some other measures are considered. Yeah, uh, indeed. I mean, it's not that the Commission is against uh, negative, recognizing negative emissions and potentially also in the ETS. It's just that the idea is that because we have the carbon removal frameworks upcoming, it makes sense to consider, that, consider it all as a package. And it also means that we need to consider it, for example, for CCU, not only for CCS. So we, we think that it is best to wait for that framework to be there so that we then consider it. It's not that it could not happen in the future that BEX is recognized, um, but it will be done. It will be done then. And also taking into account that that is not currently the focus of the ETS, that it is to reduce the, the emissions. Thank you, Marina. I see there are a few other quite specific questions on the topic of UTS. Um, one is about the uh, industrial plant, why they're, but this is more on the red actually. So I'm not sure this is the best uh, place to answer that. Um, there is one about uh, indeed the zero rate of biomass. So uh, Yelmer Klassen is asking if there is an op opt out possible from the system. Do you have a comment on this Marina? There's rules for opt-outs, but those are uh, for the member states to decide and uh, they are to exclude smaller installations when they're subject to alternative measures. So in theory, not, there wouldn't be, there's not a possibility for installations to opt out themselves. There's only that rule that if they use 100% of biomass, they, well, it biomass cause 100% of the emissions and now lower to 95. Sure thing, like one last question, maybe Marina, and then of course, uh, maybe we will address the other question after the event because we're running a little bit late on time. Uh, it's about the use of biomethane for replacing natural gas. Uh, is this accounted as part of the offsetting? Um, well, it depends on what we would be understanding as, as offsetting. So we have the rules that I explained on how you account emissions and to the degree that something is biomass, it is zero rated. So it is that same context. That could apply, which just means that when in doing the calculation of the emissions, it would just be multiplied by zero when it's biomass. Thank you so much, Marina. I think that was uh, indeed really interesting. And thank you also, Yap, and all the participants that put forward questions. Uh, indeed, uh, we may follow up on some of the questions that we were not able to address now during the discussion, maybe after the event. But now, before digging into our panel discussion, I would like to sense a little bit the interest of the audience. So I would like to launch the first poll for today's event. And my question to you is, do you expect an increase in the use of bioenergy for industrial application? Do you see this just for certain temperatures or um, applications? You don't see any increase at all, or do you see it for a different application? So right now we have approximately 130 people online. So I'm really interested to see what uh, our attendees thinks about this. And then I we will move on without further ado to our panel discussion. So we'll leave another few seconds for people to make up their mind on this question. I see votes are coming in. And I see that now we have more than half of the participants that answer. So I will just wait two other seconds. And I think now we can close the poll and show the results. So I think it's uh, quite, uh, there is quite an agreement uh, with that uh, indeed there will be an increase in the use of bioenergy. And uh, several of you think this will be in different applications. So not just limited to one type of application. This is really, I think, an interesting take, and uh, I'm sure our distinguished panelists will also have their say on this. So let me please introduce the, the first panel panelist for today. So Philip, I will kindly ask you to take the floor. I mean, you're head of the Berlin office of the German the industry, the German industry of Lyme Federation. So please, Philip, uh, uh, can you tell us a few your opinion on the topic of industrial decarbonization and uh, tell us a bit more maybe about uh, B the BK? Thank you so much, Irene, um, and uh, hello from my side to everybody. Um, thanks, Jeff and uh, Marina, for your excellent presentation. Very interesting. I could ask a lot of questions now, but um, I was told to uh, tell you something first. Um, re referring to the, to the poll, I think um, we have to see that uh, biomass uh, is and will be a very limited good. So um, we have to discuss uh, now and in the future uh, where we want to use this efficient 
and, and therefore I think, um, yes, at the moment we see it in various applications and um, uses in very, uh, very different uh, sectors, but um, it might be better to focus on this. But um, who I am and where I'm from, um, I was kindly introduced um, yet, but I'm working for the German Lime Industry and um, this is a very energy intensive and carbon intensive industry. Um, what do we do? Um, we produce, uh, uh, well, a basic product, I'd say, uh, which is used in very different applications. For example, to produce steel, even green steel, um, makes our uh, water clear and fresh again, um, and also for, for medicines is used. So it's a it's very broad use of our product. Um, but uh, as I said, it's, it's quite energy and CO2 intensive. Why is that? Uh, we need a lot of energy to heat up the limestone we burn um, to get, uh, let's say, rid of the CO2 in it, um, to have the lime as a product that can be used in, for example, the, uh, the steel production. Um, so we have um, some uh, challenges ahead. Uh, and you see on my uh, first slide, um, um, can you see the slide? Ah, uh, yeah, so, ah, yeah, here we go. Um, and uh, there we have three challenges I want to stress. Uh, the material-based CO2, energy and climate costs, and actually at the moment, um, a lack of a political framework um, that uh, we, we want to build. And I think the Fit for 55 program is the place where the European Commission wants to build such a framework. Um, so what about the material-based emissions? As I said, um, we have a lot of them. Uh, uh, Two-thirds of our total emissions are related to the material itself, so it cannot be avoided chemically. Um, so we have to think of other options uh, to do this, even 100% um, use of renewable energy biomass, green hydrogen, for example, or if it would possible, which is, isn't yet, um, use more electricity. Um, we also, we still have a two third of our emissions, uh, which brings me to the energy and climate costs. Um, we have about 50% and more um, of our revenues are just used for uh, fixing this energy and climate cost resulting from the ETS and also, um, uh, well, the use of, of energy. Um, why is this? Uh, we benefit from free allocation, that's true, but in our specific case, it's limited to less than our process emissions. So even if we have 100% biomass or green hydrogen within our system and our use, we still would have um, uh, CO2 costs uh, left. Um, so that's that's a big uh, big issue for us, and it's a major factor also for the transformation um, we have to talk about. Where can we um, put incentives that um, well uh, that brings us to let's say climate uh, neutrality, or as I had pointed out, um, below climate positivity, and um, that leads to my uh, to the third challenge. Uh, that's the lack of a let's say comprehensive political framework that enables. Um, uh, that enables also negative emissions, the use and the storage of um, carbon capture. Um, the solution is for material-based um, CO2, uh, so the process um, CO2, it is carbon capturing. And we can decide what we do with the CO2 in, an, in a second step, but that's key um, for us. I think um, and uh, also, for example, the cement industry uh, as well, that the use of carbon uh, can be a very interesting short-term option for reductions. So if we want to uh, defossilize and decarbonize fast, um, the use is a very uh, strong thing. And I think we have to talk about the legal framework that's needed. The storage is definitely the long-term option. Um, we have to focus, I agree, that this will take place after 2030, but the basis has to be laid um, at the moment. Um, I talked about the climate and um, uh, energy costs. There we have like the carbon leakage protection. And um, I think uh, one solution for the short and medium term is to, uh, um, to prevent or to uh, uh, prevent a, um, 
the free allocation on um, on process emissions. I think that's that's a very important uh, point. Um, incentivizing incentivizing uh, the transformation. I just name carbon contracts for difference, a biomass strategy. We can talk about this later in the discussion and also an incentive for negative emission. And um, therefore, I think the um, the proposal of Mr. Lisa is a quite interesting one. I hope we can discuss this um, uh, during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Indeed, several interesting points, and thanks for bringing indeed the perception of an industrial uh, uh, sector, which is indeed quite interesting in decarbonization. But let's move on to the next panelist and maybe bring on a different perspective, well, one from a regional, let's say, approach. So, Christiane, uh, I will ask you to step in as you are Deputy General Manager of the Energy Agency of Upper Austria. So, Christiane, please, you have four minutes. Cool. Yes, thank you. <laughs> like the previous speaker, <laughs> I had six. <laughs> okay, uh, good morning from my side. Um, I'm in the region of Upper Austria between Vienna and Salzburg in the northern part of Austria. And my organization is the regional energy agency of the region. So we are here uh, to drive the energy transition in all areas in our region. Upper Austria, 1.5 million, and we are uh, the industrial heart of Austria. So we have all these high energy intensive industries, Yab showed steel, chemical, um, cement, uh, we have, you name them, we have them. For this reason, for us, um, as you can see on my first slide, the industrial energy transition is critical. Critical for the success, 44% of our total energy consumption is from industrial processes. And what is interesting, uh, it's not all iron, steel, and chemical, but there's also a lot of other manufacturing industries which are maybe uh, not always at the center of attention. So um, I think this is worthwhile mentioning. It's critical for our competitiveness. Industry accounts for 40% of our GDP. And we have been quite been quite successful in the past uh, 15 years. So this, despite an economic growth of over 60%, we managed to decrease our GHG emissions from industry. But clearly, a slight decrease in the view of our targets is not enough. So where are we? On my next slide, you can see how much we have managed the energy transition and what bioenergy has to do with it. So in the overall primary energy consumption, uh, renewables account for 30%. And so this is everything from steel making to home heating uh, and from transporting goods to service provisions, 30%. Uh, roughly half of this is from uh, sustainable bioenergy. So this is quite a high percentage uh, for a highly industrialized region. Basically, the other half is hydro we have very little wind. When it comes to electricity, uh, bioenergy is about 7%. When it comes to space heating, 60% of our space heating is already from renewables. If you uh, participate in some debates in the Brussels bubble on this subject, you would think renewable heating is rocket science. It is not, <laughs> as you can see here. Uh, you just need the right policies and uh, more than half of this is bioenergy. And in manufacturing, uh, over 40% is from renewables and about 18% uh, is uh, from sustainable bioenergy. When I talk about bioenergy, I mean woody biomass in our context because that is by far uh, the dominant uh, bioenergy source. How did we get there? We use something which I call the carrot sticks, tambourines and skateboard approach. So obviously carrots is the regulatory framework. Um, European Union helps us a lot with these these days. Thank you very much. Um, uh, stricter is better from our perspective because that makes our lives easier. Um, we have the carrots, which is all the financial incentives. We see loads of money uh, coming in uh, to our system. Uh, if we can stay with the sticks, carrots, and tambourines, please. Um, so we, we need to spend this money. Yes, thank you. Then we have the tambourine, which is the awareness raising, uh, the information, the training, and we have uh, the skateboard, which is the innovation. 
For uh, bioenergy and industry, we will need all these four. And these together, maybe we can, if you're interested, go later uh, in the debate into the different aspects of these carrot sticks and tambourines. And why are we doing this? Because we have a vision uh, for our industry that I think is now shared by many on my final slide. You can see it. So uh, in 2017, I made this slide. Uh, because if you discuss with industry, of course, there's always the discussion, what's the next big thing? After industry 4.0, clearly, what's the next big thing? So um, fi five years ago, I was uh, <laughs> um, courageous enough to say industry 5.0 will be the industry that is independent from fossil fuel. And this is a decisive factor for their competitiveness. And if you approach the industrial energy transition from this perspective, suddenly uh, maybe you will have more uh, actors on your side. And with that, I would like to close and look forward to the debate. Thank you, Irene. Thank you so much, Christiane. Very interesting perspective indeed from the local uh, approach. Uh, I would like to move on to Shalini which is from Perpetual Next. So Shalini, uh, Perpetual Next is quite an innovative company. So I think from your side, we'll be interested to know a little bit more how re regulation and which drivers policies can also introduce to help companies such as yours to in the carbonization efforts. So Shalini, please, the floor is yours. Good morning. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to be present this morning. I think I'm uh, from an engineering background, I do quite a lot of work with technology development and product quality. So it's really enriching for me to be with people who, who make the policies, who drive the policies, who need to use the policies, like uh, Christian just uh, explained, we're all in this together. We need the right policies. Uh, I mean, the EU ETS provides a fantastic framework and it's encouraging to see that there's, there's more coming in terms of making it more robust, more perhaps more flexible, but as also as um, Philip mentioned, we need further measures to enable the industry to work with the right framework and bring together uh, the bioenergy. So I'm just going to briefly talk about what we, we do and drive as a company, and then I'm just going to end with a little bit on, on what I do at Perpetual Next. So I think we would all agree that as uh, policy makers, as people in government, as scientists, technology developers, and as humans, we have a global duty to abate a global warming because we know that it's a, it's a big problem. And without the right measures in place, consequences could be catastrophic. So wh wh what, what do we focus on as, as a business? I mean, if you look at the, the diagram on the slide, you can see that uh, one of the sectors in our society that's still very heavily reliant on fossil-based materials is the carbon as a raw material for chemicals and derived materials. So that's the carbon embedded in materials. And in 2020, the reliance on fossil-based sources was still very significant. I mean, carbon is present in everything. I was just thinking about my morning today, from the toothbrush I used, to my shampoo, to the floor I stood on, to the car I drove, to the house I'm sat in, and multiple other objects that I used this morning have got carbon in them. And as we move towards 2050 with global population rising and advances in so many different areas and improvement in quality of life, this demand for carbon is going to grow. And if we are to move away from fossils, we need to find alternative sources for this carbon. And this is where we come in. We want as a company to be able to enable industries and companies to continue to manufacture these material based on carbon by providing them with a renewable source of carbon based on organic waste. So we want to be able to contribute to that green box on, on my right, growing the, the bio-based in 2050. And in, on my next slide, I'm just going to explain. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so as you can see, um, you have different sources of organic waste. So these plant materials would have absorbed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we have uh, designed and implemented a torrefaction, which is a heat treatment that the different organic waste go through. 
and they therefore are converted to materials where the carbon is enriched and in a stable form. And therefore this carbon can be used in a range of industries uh, from steel, metal, building and agriculture. And another sector that we're really uh, investing a lot of time is, is the, the biochar application into the ground where the carbon dioxide is, is converted to a stable carbon that stays in the ground and at the same time improves soil. So this is what we do. And on my next slide, I'm just going to show um, that as a company, we believe we need to create and innovate and, and adapt. So we, 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 we do quite a lot of partnership works with a lot of universities and research institutes and partners. And you can see uh, we, we work with various uh, universities in the UK where I'm based. I'm based at the pilot facility in Derby, but we're also expanding to other partners in Europe and I hope further afield as well. And it's been, it's been really good. It's been really informative. It helps our, our development. It helps the way we've developed the technology. Um, I mean, one little success story from our plant is when we looked at different forestry uh, residues and ash wood, it's a type of wood appeared to be really problematic on a lab scale. And indeed the same was observed when we ran it in our uh, large uh, one, two ton an hour plant. So we learned from the university joint project to be very careful with, with this wood. So that's uh, what very briefly what I wanted to share this morning. Thank you. And Thank this is so just, uh, yeah, this is just an illustration. You can see the, the, the bottom line, the ash wood has lots of uh, peaks, which shows its extreme reactivity compared to the other woody residues that we experimented. Thank you, Thank you so much, Shalini, and thanks indeed for bringing a more technical perspective to the discussion. I think that's also quite relevant when talking about industry decarbonization. And on this note, maybe I would like to, to move on to our last speaker, uh, which is Thomas from Valmet, which is another quite uh, important player in this context. So, Thomas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and first of all, thanks for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Very important and interesting topic. Um, I'm Tuomas Petanen. I'm the head of energy segment industrial internet in Valmet. And Valmet is leading process technologies, automation services for pulp paper and energy industries. And, uh, and if I say a few words about the industrial internet itself, it's about utilizing digitalization to improve the customer processes. Just a few words about Valmet. So, so first of all, we have quite unique offering in that sense that we are combining process technologies, services and automation together. Uh, we have different markets that we are participating in and, and energy being one of the key markets. Perhaps other thing worth mentioning is that pulp and paper industries where we are coming from and that was also quite visible in Mr. Jaap Koppejan's presentation that that's where the process team part plays a big role. Uh, we have quite global presence. We are working in different parts of the world and we are also investing a lot on the sustainability. That's a strong focus for us. And if, we, if I look at the perspective for this, uh, this webinar, the key thing is that what is the use of the biomass in the future? Um, we see three main points. Um, as was al already stated earlier, this process team and electricity is definitely an important part. It was already said that both of those are expected to go grow going forward. And of course, it's mainly for the energy intensive industries. Uh, the second part, is the, what is the role of actually digitalization here? And uh, we see that there will be two different roles in this. One is just about securing that the plant performance and reliability can be on a higher level than earlier. And maybe the second part being the most important looking at, looking at the decarbonization is the, is the network flexibility. So how to optimize the steam and electricity production at the same time. Uh, the third part we see, see is the, uh, towards more valuable products. 
So, so we see that there are global trends going that way, that, the, that we are looking for higher value. And, and at the same time, it often means that the volume of, of these kind of fuels, materials and chemicals could be smaller. But these are the three main perspectives that we see for this topic. Thank you, Thomas. And maybe uh, since uh, you were talking about this, I can uh, think we can further discuss indeed on the synergies between digitalization and bioenergy and how Valmet or other actors uh, such as Valmet also see the potential of digitalization to improve uh, plant efficiency, reduce resource utilization and uh, overall have an, a positive impact on the decarbonization of industry. Maybe you want to say a couple of words about this too? Yeah. Uh if I just think about the plant level, when plant level, it's uh, mainly about the improving flexibility of the steam and electricity production. Uh, it's also about the making sure that the reliable per operation actually occurs, because that's a key thing. If there is, if the reliability doesn't happen, basically it means that there is always some backup needed for the steam production, and quite often the backup is fossil fuels. That's the current situation. Uh, also, uh, digitalization can help us uh, in the efficiency side, and also we can secure more stable production when the fuel qualities are varying. So, so this kind of uh, solution on the plant level. Thank you so much, Thomas. That's really an inter interesting insight. And uh, I see a question are popping up in the box, so I'm really happy to take a few on board. I think the first one is on the lime industry. So Philip, I would like to get back to you maybe. And the question is how the lime industry sees uh, CCUS or BEX, so biomass with CCU. And uh, would you capture CO2 from lime within the process and use bio-based fuel for that? Or it will be uh, considering negative emissions? Maybe Philip, you want to, to touch on this topic more in general as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, for us, uh, the use of carbon capture is uh, is necessary, definitely. Um, and uh, we also believe that um, part of the biomass should be used where uh, carbon capture installations um, are based. So why is that? Um, we have a huge challenge, not just as industry, but as a, as a whole society. Uh, ahead, there will be some emissions, um, especially from agriculture, um, that we cannot um, avoid, that will be there. Um, ours can be avoided uh, chemically, but with uh, carbon capture, we can hinder them in uh, entering the atmosphere. So um, we, we can avoid them finally. And um, using biomass uh, has the advantage that we will be able to produce negative emissions. Um, so uh, this is a very, very huge plus for some industries where carbon capture installations um, are needed. And combining those two elements, I think, um, well, needs to be one of the industrial focuses of the national governments, but also um, the uh, European uh, Commission. And if I might add just one word on um, the, po the political framework, um, we've discussed this uh, not just within the lime industry, but also with other energy intensive industries. Um, we, we believe that uh, the, the framework for negative emissions should be part of the European emission trading system. Why? Because we have a system that, well, has the possibility to um, um, integrate such such a rule and such an incentive without building up a whole new system. So we know the ETS and we think it's a good system um, for uh, carbon incentives or for climate um, incentives, and it should be used. It can be an additional one um, uh, with the carbon removal framework for let's say medium or short term um, reductions by um, frustration and something like that. Um, but there's a difference between the CCS or um, BEX or BECCS um, and, um, and forest. And so, so this might be a thought worth to, to separate both and to include um, the industrial um, negative emissions within the ETS. Thank you, Philip. That's uh, indeed 
quite an interesting discussion, still going on, of course, and still development. So uh, I think it's good to have also your, your perspective on this. But as you touch upon the political framework and the incentives, I see from the chat that there are a few questions for Christiane. I think your presentation raised uh, some comments indeed. So the first one is about uh, how to motivate uh, medium-sized companies, so which are not in the UETS, and uh, how they can be encouraged to generate uh, with biomass, maybe from residues or waste streams that they have on, on site, and to make this um, interesting for those kind of actors. And uh, another question, Christiane, so then you can decide how to handle them all together, is uh, if there is any example of industries that have reached Industry 5.0, and uh, if the criteria is only based on fossil energy dependency. So if you can also maybe tell us something about that too. Okay, thank you for the question first. Uh, how to motivate SMEs? Well, that's part of my daily work. Um, the, uh, I think the, the key element here, we are still in the, if we look at that Gauss curve, we are still uh, using bioenergy in non-bioenergy related industry. We are still with the early adopters. So um, we have, we are now, we feel we are moving to the next level. And in overall terms, normally forward-looking uh, company owners, also of mid-scale industries, they think they want to have modern plants. So we see no, more and more arriving in our debate, a fossil fuel-based plant for my industry, for my company is really not a long-term solution. So that's often the start of a debate that people fear this arriving, especially if, we, if they use heating oil at the moment. So where it's quite evident in my country that heating oil has a sell by date um, where uh, we will have to, everyone will have to stop using heating oil. For natural gas, we are at the beginning of this debate. So it's clear a modern plant doesn't use, fossil, it's becoming clearer. It doesn't uh, use fossil fuels. Days like this, of course, we have the whole topic of energy security. Um, I mean, uh, we, are, we get all our gas from Russia <laughs> via the Ukraine, uh, or most of it. So it's quite evident there is a, a security issue. Um, and last but not least, energy prices. <laughs> they are our dear friends in times like this. So I see quite a lot of really smiling faces upon company owners who have done the transformation and who maybe at that time took a small risk, but this is now paying off. And I encourage them to tell everyone how smart they have of the have team. The bottleneck in addition to the price situation at the moment really is that bioenergy for industry is not a standard solution. So the normal providers of industrial equipment, they, have, they will say, no, no, uh, use gas. Or, uh, that's the standard solution. It's where we were with heating 15 years ago, where the normal heating installer would say, oh, no, uh, uh, oil is the thing to do. Uh, forget about the rest. So this will be, uh, and this I ask for everyone working on a wider geographic level, with that we look at these providers of industrial equipment and um, encourage them to change their offer. And are there any industries that are ready uh, Industry 5.0, in my personal definition, um, well, I work on the energy transition, so that's why I made this. Um, but that's why I made this definition. Uh, I'm, I lead an initiative of uh, manufacturing companies of the, from different sectors who want to develop strategies and are developing action with us, a road, climate neutrality roadmaps. None of them is there, but I would say it touches upon all their energy uses from uh, process uh, to building to transport uses and they have a strategy how they will get them they will, how they will get there faster than our 2040 target in Austria. Thank you Christiane it's uh, I think your experience also gives some hopes for uh, future development on the industry so <laughs> it's also good to have a positive approach to this uh, to this discussion so thank you so much for uh, your comment I see uh, some other questions are coming in from Sh for Shalini so the first one is about the bioeconomy and uh, if there is a, a competition with bioenergy on this if this will change the quantity but also the form of biomass available for energy production and the second one is more about the projection you showed before about carbon sources for the chemical industry. 
Uh, why does synthetic methanol play a role and how do you estimate the importance of synthetic me methanol in the future? Uh, two difficult questions, Shalini, apologies, but I'm pretty sure you will have all the answers that our attendees are looking for. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, the uses in energy and heat compared to chemicals and derived materials. I think as a business, uh, it's something that's been a debate for us internally for, for a number of years. And I think while we really see the value in using it in energy and heat, I think we believe that uh, there are other very robust uh, renewable options out there to help the energy and heat sector, maybe wind or solar or hydro and other growing uh, possibilities. And also in, uh, in, in heat and power applications, effectively you will take the sustainably sourced biomass and you effectively burn it again to generate uh, the heat and power. And in doing so, the, 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 all, the, all the carbon dioxide that would have been absorbed by the biomass will come back out. So we believe uh, by, by focusing on the uh, materials uh, and, and chemicals industry, uh, first of all, as I, as I showed in my slide, the reliance on fossil is so big that uh, we really need to address defossilization in this sector in order to be able to enable industries to produce sustainably. And also uh, in a lot of these materials, the carbon is embedded. So the carbon is, is safe and stored in a stable carbon form. So you absorb it from the atmosphere as the material is growing and then you convert it to a stable form. So in my opinion, it's going further than the heat and energy and electricity industry where it's re-emitted, it's, it's, it's keeping it stored. In terms of, um, of the uh, synthetic uh, methanol, I must confess, I really appreciate your question, but it's not an area I've, I've worked on myself. Um, extensively uh, recently, I've, I've looked at the applications more in the in the solid carbon applications. But I will I will look into it, and I would uh, of course uh, reconnect with the person who asked the question and and engage uh, after the event. But I do appreciate your question. But fortunately, I've not looked at this myself extensively already. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini, and indeed uh, thanks also for the transparency about the focus of today's event. So I, I see there is another question going back to the heat and power um, combination and the chemical materials for the main use of biomasses. So Thomas, maybe you want to comment on that about the which one should be preferred if there is any financial incentive that can support this. And if I can add on top of this, uh, I would also like to ask you if you see the Fit for 55 package because that's the main ongoing legislation, uh, having given the needed support for this kind of process. So Thomas, please. Okay, um, I would say that uh, responding to fluctuating electricity price and steam demand actually that's the most important when we are looking at the network network level, not just the single installed phase, but the total network. And uh, when we are able to predict the demand from uh, from the process team and electricity side and then build storages to the network, then biomass plant can actually balance the steam network and electricity at the same time. So that's the important part. Uh, that's how we can then minimize the use of backup fossil production, which actually normally exists in, in most of these process steam installments. What comes to fit for 55 packets, um, it has many elements support in the decarbonization, uh, but the, uh, and the aim is of course in lowering the emissions, but we were already discussing the fuel availability uh, and therefore we see that the co-firing of the uh, solid recovered fuel SRF with the biomass should be treated, treated better in this total picture because that is actually quite good way to reduce the carbon emissions. Thank you, Thomas. And um, on top of this, maybe Philippe, you also want to comment on the uh, regulatory volatility at European level. Do you believe this may be 
uh, discouraging companies to retrofit to biomass or to look for biomass and other sustainable solutions? Well, um, uncertainty or, well, um, the change, the regular change of, of a framework um, always causes um, disturbance, uh, let's put it this way. Um, but uh, I think not just our companies, but, but every, every uh, company um, wants a stable and, um, well, long lasting political framework. I think that's, that's quite important. Um, the Fit for 50, 55 uh, project as a whole, I think, um, should set the sign that this, this will lead to the way um, to uh, the European goal of climate neutrality and um, uh, is, is the framework that, that stays. So therefore, it's, it's so important to work on this properly. Um, and I'm very grateful that the discussion is so broad on, on these issues. Um, our, our industries have, um, or our companies um, make investments for decades. So I think the oldest oven we have is nearly a hundred years old. Um, so our companies will decide once which technology um, they introduce. And um, I have to say it, it should be the right one where they can um, earn their money, where they can produce climate neutral now or in the future. And um, this, is, this is important for us. That's why we, we need long lasting and stable political uh, conditions on this. And well, we are, we're happy to work on this together. Indeed, thank you, Philip. Uh, really, I, I completely agree with what you just said. But uh, I, we are going, we are heading towards the end of uh, today's event. So I would like to ask each of the panelists uh, um, some sort of final remarks, let's say, on the discussion we've been having. And uh, I would uh, challenge you if you had a magic wand or if you ask for whatever you want, would be, which would be the, um, the driver for the decarbonization? What would be the, what would you ask for? So um, maybe uh, Shalini, you want to start? Yes, thank you, uh, Irene. I think uh, broadly, I think based on today's discussion, if I had a, um, a magic wand, I think I'd like to see all the policies in place to really encourage uh, industry to decarbonize and, and move towards uh, renewable sources of carbon and help uh, tackle what we have as a big problem. But I guess after all, I am an engineer and I've got to stick to my uh, torrefaction reactor. So if I really have a magic wand, I would design a torrefaction reactor at Perpetual Next that you could put a very wide range of organic residues and press a button based on the application in the industry that it would go and the magic product will be there. So that, that will be what I'll be working on in the years to come to deliver this goal. Unfortunately, I won't have a magic wand. It's a real come for a lot of hard work, but also quite a high level of commitment. Thank you very much. Well, Shalini, I think the good news is I don't think you will need a magic wand and we will get there. I mean, it may take some time, but I'm pretty sure that the work is proceeding in this way. So uh, the best of luck also for this. And uh, Mimi Thomas, you want to share your uh, two minutes final thoughts on what you would ask for? Yeah, uh, first of all, I believe in market-based and technology-neutral system. So therefore, this uh, EU emission trading system has been working well, and I believe that will be working also well in the future. Uh, if I really had a magic wand, I think you get what you measure. So I think that digitalization would actually enable also real-time follow-up of the CO2 emissions if you think about the timing up to 2030, it's not that long time. And if we are looking at the status once per year, it's not the right way. So magic wand, start figuring out how to measure it in real time. And that way we actually have an understanding how we're making the right progress and right decisions getting there. Thank you, Thomas. In the meantime, I see some more questions are popping in. So maybe uh, you can quickly comment on uh, um, the worries about the framework, so about in particular sustainability of biomass in red two and red three. 
maybe just a final thought about this, since it seems to be quite a relevant topic for uh, our audience. Uh, that, that's me. Uh, it's both you and Thomas, but yes, please, Philip, go ahead. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's not especially for Germany, but um, uh, for Germany, I, I, I can, I think, speak that uh, this, the aspect of sustainability is key in public acceptance for um, many things um, and therefore uh, for biomass as well. Um, and we, we, we support a strong sustainability framework on this, but um, uh, we have also to see uh, where this biomass came from and um, how do we uh, have like uh, a sufficient a sufficient supply and combining this with sustainability aspects i think that's that's key so it's it's more more than just one one part um of of the metal it's always both um I, i'm pretty confident that that this will uh, work out um finally but sustainability will be key um in in the acceptance and so, Philip, what would you ask for if you could make a wish about uh, the future? Well, if, if I could make a wish, I, I'd like to combine two things. So uh, I, I believe that the uh, EU ETS is the instrument we um, have to go with. I think it's a good instrument um, with a clear aim. But to combine this with um, like a perfect carbon leakage protection, that makes it even a stronger element so that we don't see uh, production shifted as a recent, um, uh, and recent survey uh, of the German industry, um, my former employer showed. Um, so combining these two will set a very strong incentive and um, well, um, we'll work on the ETS. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll make, make a good progress on this. Just a short comment on the biomass as well. So quite it's often the biomass is thought that it's it's coming from the from the forests right away, but the, but the biomass that is utilized, it's it's normally some kind of process residues. So I think that it's already sustainable biomass that that is being utilized. I think that's one of the key things to to consider. Absolutely. Thanks for the punctuation, Thomas. I think it's also very good to remember that indeed. Uh, Biomass is, first of all, not just forest biomass. We have a different set of uh, feedstock, and also that most of the time it comes from residues, forest management practice, byproducts, uh, uh, you name it. But uh, I would like also to ask Christiane to step up and say a couple of final remarks and yeah. which are your wishes. Christiane. My wishes. I have three, if I may. So oh, the great. first is, yeah, I'm <laughs> Christmas is far away. Uh, so the first is policy attention to both industry, I'm always very disappointed when you are in debates in the energy field uh, and then you say, oh, industry, oh, it's done by ETS. So it, it, not everything is in ETS. Uh, so we need to drive the attention to manufacturing in overall and to how absolutely critical it is to keep the manufacturing in Europe and we can do this by making it sustainable. So, um, and the second is, of course, always policy attention to bioenergy. Uh, bioenergy Europe knows this. No, renewables is not only about wind, uh, solar and hydro. There is a nice little one, actually the largest one. So we need really to join forces with everyone here to draw attention to, especially people living in big cities who have no clue. Uh, as Thomas said, uh, no, we are not taking the trees uh, and burn them. No, it's usually residues or it's any other kind of byproduct. So policy attention number one. Uh, wish number two is that uh, supply chains, uh, all the, the companies that are supplying industry, machinery, industry solution, often there are solution providers uh, that provides, for example, the whole powder coating machinery. And if they transform the offer, we will have uh, made a big step for, forward. And the third wish is um, that many of you will join uh, us 
uh, at our upcoming conference, the World Sustainable Energy Days. Uh, there is a conference on wood pellets uh, to, in which Bioenergy Europe is part of the European Wood Pellet Conference. And there is also a dedicated conference on uh, industrial uh, energy efficiency. Uh, they are held on 6th and 7th of April. And hopefully I'll see many of you there to discuss how we can take bioenergy and industry a step further. Thank you, Christiane, and thanks also for mentioning the conference. Happy to be joining you there in April. Uh, I would like to um, maybe, I mean, it was a very interesting session, so it's going to be difficult for me to wrap this up in just a few minutes, but I will try my best. I think we had quite a good discussion on the topic of uh, industry decarbonization, showing how this goes with challenges, but also with uh, opportunities. And the challenges will lie ahead, of course, with the revision of the UETS. But we also see that when we look at industry, it's not just about the UETS. There is also much more, uh, low and medium temperature, SMEs, bigger companies. I mean, all can be involved in this, uh, in the transition. And I think digitalization and innovation will play a key role there. So um, I think we got some food for thoughts. We could have gone on uh, for another hour or so, also because I see that the question are coming on uh, still. Uh, but before concluding, I would like to thank, first of all, well, the speakers and the panelists that joined me today. I think uh, I was really happy to have your expertise and your knowledge on this sector, and uh, glad to hear your views and opinion on this topic. But I would also like to thank the other partners that uh, have Bioenergy Europe organizing this event. And in particular, I'm thinking about the International Energy Agency, so the IA Bioenergy, the ETIP Bioenergy, so the Technology Innovation Platform, uh, two Euro, uh, Horizon 2020 founded projects, which are music and rest for industry, and all the partners, of course, of this project, but also uh, CIRSA and WIP Renewable Energies. And uh, all the other colleagues and uh, attendees that also joined us for today. So thank you again. The recording and the presentations will be made available. And I hope to see you at our next event. Have a very nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.